and welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. Are you bothered with a cough? Do you have shortness of breath, wheezing, tightness in the chest? Do you wake up in the middle of the night with smothering sensation? When you exercise, walk, or jog, do you have to stop because you're so short of breath you can't go further? We'll be talking about that in this show. Uh, my guest is Dr. Phil Jones. Dr. Jones is a board-certified allergist and a board-certified pulmonologist. He'll be answering our questions. Hello, I'm Dr. Robert Overholt, and I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes on The Dr. Bob Show. Later on, we'll be talking how being a little overweight or a whole lot overweight can harm your health and, yes, can make it where we die earlier. And are we eating too much salt in our diet or is there too much worry about salt? A lot of information for you. You'll want to stay tuned. We're talking with Dr. Phil Jones, board certified allergist and board certified pulmonologist. That's a lung specialist. And we're going to be talking about cough and wheeze. Phil, welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. Thank you, Dr. Bob. It's great to be here. Where did you do your training in allergy and pulmonology? Same place? I had a unique opportunity to train at Vanderbilt. And at Vanderbilt, they had a program where you could do allergy and pulmonary at the same time. And so you're board certified in both of those? Absolutely. Uh-oh, that means you're smarter than I am. So let's get to it. I doubt that. If a person has an asthma attack, what symptoms do they have? You know, asthma is a really fascinating disease and it's different in a lot of different people. Some people, they just cough all the time. Some people, it's a life-threatening problem. They can't breathe, they're gasping, distress. So, ICU intensive care units, life-threatening. So there's a wide variety of how severe it is. Uh, is cough part of the symptoms? Absolutely. Why do the people cough? People cough because they have inflammation in the airways. And that makes it irritated and they cough because of that. Do they have wheezing? Most asthmatics will wheeze. There is a cough variant to asthma that doesn't always wheeze, but most patients with asthma will wheeze. Okay, and when they wheeze, what is a wheeze? A wheeze is kind of a whistling sound. Now, not all wheezing is asthma, but just about all wheezing is uh, asthma. Name me two or three things that cause wheezing that are not asthma. Some things that you might not think of, laryngopharyngeal reflux, when so, things come up from the stomach yeah. and the back of the throat. Uh, Postnasal drip occasionally can cause wheezing. Heart failure. Uh, heart failure, yeah. pulmonary edema yeah. can cause wheezing. So lots of things. All Absolutely. that we've got no axiom, all that wheezes is not asthma. But wheezing is a high-pitched whistle. In asthma, is it usually when they breathe in or usually when they breathe out? It's usually as they breathe out. And, and why do people get short of breath? People get short of breath because their airways are inflamed, narrowed, and they also have some smooth muscle bronchospasm, constriction. And it's just hard to breathe through a narrow tube. I always tell patients, you can breathe through a garden hose, but think about trying to breathe through a straw. You get short of breath. Yeah, real short of breath. But that yeah. is it. Frightening to a patient when they've got really significant asthma. Very frightening. Having taken care of a lot of different type patients in the intensive care type environment and clinic environment, some patients that I see suffer, true suffering, are people who are short of breath and can't catch their next breath. Can exercise cause people to have wheezing? Exercise can cause bronchospasm, but we still tell people to exercise with asthma. So uh, how do you do that? If, you, if exercise causes wheezing, you want them to exercise, what do you do? Well, you have to take precautions. Some people when they exercise in the heat of summer and the humidity and, and pollution or poor qual air quality index, it may not be the best day for them. But in general, we tell them to warm up before exercise, cool down after exercise, and sometimes we'll use albuterol before exercise. Now, albuterol, you can use that if somebody has an asthma attack. Is that called a what? That is a rescue medication. So all patients with asthma need a rescue medication. Some people with asthma need a preventative medication. Now, the rescue medication, uh, what are some examples? Uh, examples would be albuterol, and that's the one we use most commonly. There's some alternatives, but most of the time we use albuterol. So that and would be Ventolin, Proair, Proventil, Zopinex, th those ones. Correct. How quick does it work? Those work very quick. Uh, and that's the beauty of those. We're in distress, we need quick relief, we've got it. How long does it last? Uh, typically three to four hours. So it doesn't fix asthma. The problem is asthmatics, 
they take their rescue inhaler, they feel different. They open up, they feel better quickly. And that misleads them and they don't use their preventative medications like they should. Now, a preventative medicine it has to be something that's going to prevent the person from having attacks. Well, name me some, how does that work? I always tell patients as I'm trying to stress to them the importance of a preventative medication, I would say, if I had your asthma and I was on a deserted island and you said you can have albuterol or your preventative, I always tell them, I would take the preventative medication. It's so much more important for controlling asthma. So what does it do? Examples. Mm -hmm inhaled corticosteroids uh -huh. and leukotriene receptor antagonist. They control the inflammation, which is the root of asthma and asthma symptoms. Which is best, the uh, inhaled steroid or the leukotriene inhibitor like Singulair, Montelukast, those? Absolutely, well if I go back to my example of the deserted island, I'm gonna want the inhaled steroid. Then. Though there's certainly a role for leukotriene receptor antagonist like Singulair. So everybody that has significant asthma, they should be on an inhaled steroid or leukotriene blocker? Yes, absolutely. Good, and what are some examples of an inhaled cortisone medication? We have a, a, a large number of medications now, and there's unique advantages and disadvantages to each. Some of them now are very small particles, less laryngeal deposition, less laryngeal side effects, hoarseness or uh, candidiasis, these type things. Some of them are combination products, which have a inhaled steroid and a long-acting bronchodilator. So if I was on that island, would that be better? Yeah, depending on your asthma, yes, we do know that that is a good way to control asthma. And what are some examples of those that have both a reliever, sort of a bronchodilator, okay. and an anti-inflammatory examples? Well, the, the, given that asthma is a bronchospastic and inflammatory disease, those are great medicines for this problem. Examples, Advair, which was the first on the market, uh, second was Simbacort, and most recently was the addition of Dulera. And all three are pretty good? All three are good. And how do you know when, which medicine to give somebody? Well, we have to, there's a number of things. We sit down, we talk with the patient, we go through their history, we try to identify things that trigger their symptoms. But my favorite way to ask is, how often are you using your rescue inhaler? How many nights out of the month do you have to get up from sleep and rummage through and find it? Have you been to the emergency room? How many rounds of steroids? And can you do all the things you want to do? Because if you can't do all the things you want to do, your asthma is not controlled. So when you ask those questions, and those are brilliant questions, it gives you an idea of whether you're going to need the reliever or just the uh, or reliever plus the anti-inflammatory. Most people need the anti-inflammatory. Absolutely. And that's not the only thing. We, of course, use spirometry, which is one other piece of that puzzle when we're trying to figure out what our patient needs for treatment. And what is spirometry? Spirometry, you know, when we ask patients, how do you feel, how does it limit you, those type things, there's some subjectivity to that. There's also, we need some objective data. And this is a machine that a patient will blow into as hard as they can for as long as they can. And that will give me a flow, an, a, a, an estimate if they have mild airway narrowing, moderate or severe. Having said that though, it's not the only thing we make decisions on. I have a lot of patients who say, I don't have much trouble, I feel pretty good, I cough a little bit and this, but you do spirometry and they've got severe narrowing. We're gonna look at pulmonary function studies. With me is Amber Evans, my nurse practitioner, Amber, what do I do? All right, Dr. Bob, you're gonna take a big deep breath in and blow hard and fast as you can. Here I go. All right. Blast hard, keep going, 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 keep going. Breathe back in. Good job. How'd I do? Awesome. Well, let's take a look here. Well, here are my pulmonary function studies, and guess what? It says they're normal. Pulmonary function studies can tell us if you have asthma. It's really the only way. It's what we call spirometry. So it's very simple. It can give the doctor worlds of information. Now, I want to show you how we use an inhaler. This is an inhaler. The object is to get that down in your lungs. So we have to breathe it in long, slow, deep, and hold it. Shake it up first. Then we go <sighs> ah, 
So I counted for 10 after I breathed it in long, slow, and deep. If you breathe it in too fast like this, like an athlete, well, it becomes turbulent and won't go all the way down to the bottom of the lungs. So you've got to breathe it in long, slow, deep, and hold it. If you have difficulty timing it, we've got what we call a spacer. Now with the spacer, we're going to spray the medicine in here and then breathe it in. So we're going to push and breathe. Watch me. So I'm going to hold it for 10 seconds again. There was a horn there that meant I was breathing too fast at that little part. Great device. It will help you and your doctor be sure that you use your inhaler properly. It'll get your asthma under control. We're talking with Dr. Phil Jones, board certified allergist and board certified pulmonologist. We're talking about asthma with cough and wheeze and shortness of breath and tightness in the chest. We've talked about relievers like albuterol and we've talked about controlling the inflammation, which appears to be the most important thing you can do inhaled cortisone medicine or combination medicines. And now we want to talk about some triggers. The triggers of an asthma attack, are there more than one? I just thought all of a sudden you start wheezing. Number of triggers, and if you're an asthmatic, a key to preventing asthma symptoms is recognizing, avoiding your triggers. Classic triggers, infection would be the most common. How Even does infection trigger asthma? Things just as simple as the common cold, regular viruses that don't cause much trouble for some patients, for asthmatics can lead to severe asthma attacks, inflammation, bronchospasm. Okay, infection? Exercise, number two trigger. Again, we do want people with asthma to exercise, but we have to take appropriate measures so that they can do that. If they use an inhaler before they exercise, does that usually keep them from wheezing? Usually, but occasionally it doesn't, and they need that an anti-inflammatory drug, the inhaled steroids that we talked about earlier. Gotcha. So we've got infection, we've got exercise. What are the other triggers? Allergies. We can't forget about allergies. Most people with asthma have allergies and we need to know what are you allergic to because certain times of the year they're going to have more problem than they do other times of the year. Give me some examples of that. How can, how can allergies do that in the spring? In the spring, of course, we would think of tree pollen, February, March, April, May, grass pollen comes in behind that, allergic inflammation in the nose. But these are small particles. We can inhale those into the upper airways. Leads to allergic inflammation, bronchospasm, wheezing, shortness of breath. Fall pollen, uh, ragweed? Is yeah, that fall pollen, ragweed, yeah. weeds, common how about, triggers. How about dust and mold? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Dust mites, very common trigger, cockroach. Uh, sometimes molds uh, are important. In fact, I often will use sensitivity to a mold called alter, uh, alternaria mm -hmm. to predict that these young kids with wheezing will go on to develop asthma. Wow, uh, are there triggers that are important? Uh, there are, uh, in different patients, different things. Uh, emotion sometimes can be a real potent trigger for asthma in some patients. So it can make people have an asthma attack if they Absolutely. get upset and start yes. coughing, get excited. Yes. Uh, Cold air, warm air, which bothers the lungs? Uh, cold air, it tends to be more problematic. Cold, dry air, and if you really want to trigger it, cold, dry air and running or an aerobic type exercise. How about cigarette smoke? Yes, absolutely. In fact, cigarette smoke decreases the anti-inflammatory effect of the inhaled steroids, so it's counterproductive for our asthmatics to, we, uh, to smoke. So those are the triggers. We've got medicines to relieve, let's say, uh, a 15 year old comes in with cough and wheeze, exercise makes them wheeze, uh, and they're wheezing every day. They wake up a couple of times a week in the middle of the night. What medicines would you put them on, or what's an example rather, and how would that be working again? Let's sort of get this concise in everybody's mind. Yes, well those, that patient's frequently symptomatic. So at a minimum, they need a bronchodilator, a rescue medication. But this patient's symptomatic more often. I'd like to, if you're using albuterol more than twice a week, more than two nights a month, that's when I need to think, hey, this patient needs an anti-inflammatory agent. So that patient, for example, would get albuterol and an inhaled corticosteroid. 
Would you always do pulmonary function studies on that kind of patient? Yes, you, with asthmatics, to properly manage asthma, you have to have pulmonary function studies because there's a lot of patients who will lead you, they, they're, when you look at them, it's misleading. They look better than their pulmonary function or vice versa. Sometimes their pulmonary function is better than they look and it's part of the puzzle to pick the right medication. How good are these medicines? These medicines are excellent, you know. Back in the old days, way back there, you know, we didn't know what to do for asthma. We put, we had patients since drink coffee. I'm talking 40, 50, 60 years ago. We had them smoke cigarettes at one point. We thought that was the right answer. But now we have a better understanding of asthma and the best medicines we've ever had. Yeah, and they really are good to help the patients. Now, if somebody has asthma and their allergy testing showed they had allergies to pollen or dust or mold, uh, what do you do for the patient as far as education? And do allergy shots help people with asthma? Well, as we mentioned, identifying your trigger is key into managing asthma. We know that most patients with asthma have allergies, and if we could control their allergies, then we could better control their asthma. And certainly in those patients with allergies, immunotherapy is an invaluable therapy in controlling their symptoms. The, how does it do? Does it just get rid of the asthma or does it help get rid of the allergic part of the asthma? Or it depends on what age group you look at. If you look at children, if, we're, if they have asthma as a child and we give them immunotherapy, we can decrease their risk of asthma as an adult. In an adult, on the other hand, they already have asthma. It's established and it's a good way to control their asthma, but it's not a way to get rid of their asthma. You mentioned earlier, most asthmatics have an allergy as part of their problem. Uh, there is a medicine uh, called Zolaire that blocks the allergy. Uh, tell me a little bit, when do you use Zolaire and it, does it help people? Yeah, Zolaire is kind of a fascinating molecule and certainly the science behind it is amazing. It is a humanized mouse monoclonal antibody. Now that's, oh, that's a lot of big medical that's words. That's a lot of big words there. But fortunately it lives up to that reputation. In patients who are requiring frequent steroids, high dose inhaled steroids, emergency room visits, hospitalizations, when these other medicines we have, the inhaled steroids, the combination products can't control their symptoms, in certain patients who have allergens, year-round allergens, like dust mite, these type of molds, that medicine is very, very useful. What it does is the antibody that mediates allergic reaction, it binds to it and removes it so that it can't cause allergic reactions. Make all allergies just go away? Well, it doesn't cure the allergies, but it certainly does improve symptoms, ER visits, steroid use, quality of life, any kind of parameter you want to look at, it's a good medication for some of our asthmatics. Uh, how is that medicine given? That medicine is given by injection, and depending on levels of your IgE, it can be once a month or once every two weeks. And expensive? Very expensive medication, but if you Compare that to the cost of emergency room visits, unscheduled uh, ER visits, loss of product productivity in your work environment, it more than pays for itself. You see a lot of patients with asthma, if they take the Zolaire shot with their other medications, uh, that it gives them significant relief? I do see patients who get significant relief from that and a, and a whole new appreciation for life. Uh, one other thing before we leave, an action plan. If somebody has asthma, what is an action plan that everybody's supposed to have? Yeah. To, to, you know, we have a lot of wonderful medicines available for asthma. And I can prescribe all the medicines in the world. But if I don't have that good partnership with the patient uh, and they're not involved in the decision making, especially teenagers, you know, there's a lot of, sure. lot of non-compliance and they want to be a part of the program. So one way to facilitate that partnership with a patient is an action plan. And an action plan is a plan that allows a patient at home to judge their symptoms. Now this can be done either by how they feel, coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath, or with a peak flow meter, they can check their peak flow, a little device they blow into and there's a normal range, a yellow range means, hey, something's going on, we better look around. Red range, something's wrong, I need help. And do they know with an action plan when to call their doctor, when to go to the emergency room? Absolutely, and that's the beauty of that. And it also allows them to make decision treatments at home. Is it fun taking care of asthmatics? It's, it's the best thing I do is take care of asthmatics. Because? I can see patients who are 
in the ICU on a ventilator from a, a life-threatening asthma attack, and I can take them from that to the office where they're sitting laughing, their lung function is completely back to normal, and they have a you know, wonderful life, and it's very rewarding to take care of. It must be fantastic to be an allergist and pulmonologist combined to treat patients with asthma, to people that are incapacitated, and all of a sudden you've allowed them to live a normal life again. Phil Jones, you're a wonderful teacher. Thank you for coming to the Dr. Bob Show. Thank you. A lot of information. If you have cough, wheeze, shortness of breath, tightness in the chest, need to see an allergist, need to see a specialist, need to get on the right program. Now, stay tuned. We're going to be talking about how being overweight can bother your health and it can actually cause us to die early. And salt. Is too much salt really bad or could we have a little bit more? A lot of information for you. Stay tuned. I want to thank Dr. Phil Jones' excellent discussion on asthma. If you've got asthma, remember, there may be a life for you. Now, questions for you, the viewer, that I think will be important to your health. Dr. Bob, I know a lot of people that are overweight and they don't really have health problems. Is it really dangerous to people and how does it cause health problems? You know, that's an excellent question. Uh, we know that there are a lot of people overweight and it's becoming a bigger and bigger and bigger problem in the United States. There's an epidemic of obesity, so let's look at some of the problems that obesity can cause that you don't think about. People that are obese have an increased chance of having obstructive sleep apnea. The diaphragm doesn't move down well against the abdomen, and so they have to pull to breathe in at nighttime, and when they pull, the back of the throat can close off. It can block the breathing. That's what we call obstructive sleep apnea. When you're not breathing for 15 or 20 seconds, the brain recognizes that and says, wake up. But when it does that, it puts out a lot of adrenaline and you get high blood pressure, you can get heart rhythm problems. So that's one way that obesity can do cause problems. Obesity causes the pancreas, which puts out insulin, not to work well. They become insulin resistant. So the insulin that the pancreas puts out to help uh, metabolize blood sugar, it, the insulin doesn't work, so the blood sugar goes high. So we've got type 2 diabetes, and when the type 2 diabetes is there, increased chances of blindness, increased incidence of heart attacks, increased incidence of uh, getting amputations. And so uh, obesity increases the chances of type 2 diabetes. People that are obese, frequently have cholesterol problems. And if the cholesterol is high, they get hardening of the arteries. And if they get hardening of the arteries, they can either start getting hardening of the arteries of the extremities, and we get pain and cramping of the legs when we walk, or we can get pain in the heart. The blood vessels get clogged up with cholesterol, and people get angina, or can get heart attacks, or can get strokes. The high blood pressure that people have, that can lead to heart failure and can also lead to stroke. And so being obese, yeah, it can cause lots of health problems. The one good thing that being obese can do, it puts a lot of bounce when we walk. That puts a little bit of calcium on the bones. But people that are obese and overweight, they're asking for health problems later on. So we always talk about exercise, eating properly, and getting, getting eight hours of sleep. If you're obese, it makes it difficult to do that. Uh, look at your weight, uh, Google a body mass index, get it down to where you should be. Question number two, Dr. Bob, I've heard controversies on salt. Too much, too little, what's the real scoop? Well. We have too much salt in our diets in the United States, and there are some people that if they eat too much salt, they can get high blood pressure, and as we said, high blood pressure can lead to heart attacks and stroke. Now, one teaspoon of salt is 2,300 milligrams, 2,300 milligrams. More than that is too much salt. So really, there's not a lot of salt that should be in your diet. If you've got some heart problems, it should be 1,500 milligrams. So if we eat fruits, and we eat vegetables, and we don't salt them, and we eat lean fish and chicken, not a lot of salt in those, but you'd be surprised where you do find salt. 
Uh, you can find that in milk. You can find it in peanut butter. You can find it in sandwich meat. And so you have to be very careful that you don't eat too much. It can be a killer. It's supposed to be able to save $16 billion if people would, in the United States help if they would cut down on their salt. That's an amazing figure. So think about your salt when you're eating potato chips or when you're putting salt on your food. That's all the time that we have for this show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Remember how important the exercise is. It reduces stress. It makes us feel better. It lowers our blood pressure. It takes the cholesterol and gets it out of some of the vessels by elevating the good cholesterol. Get eight hours of sleep. When you get eight hours of sleep, you'll perform better. You'll be healthier when you get those eight hours of sleep. You'll feel better. And remember, eat properly. Start eating a good breakfast and then let it be less and let it be less and less. More salads without a lot of stuff on the salads. Uh, watch your salad dressing. They can be dangerous also. Have a lot of fruits as your snacks. And most of all, what is it we like in the Dr. Bob Show? Are you laughing enough? Is there laughter in your life? Find somebody that you can laugh and giggle. Relax a, bit, a little bit. And when you laugh a lot, you'll stay. 